So the, the topic of this discussion, I don't want to call it a lecture, but it's really just a discussion about implant prosthetics for the ge general practitioner. Now, when we have complicated implant prosthetic problems, we have the prosthodontist to refer to, but some of us live in areas where maybe we don't have that luxury. So it really is in our best interest to make sure that if we can, uh, try to solve implant prosthetics for these patients. Now, one can imagine 20 years ago, the average implant didn't necessarily show up at our doorstep that we didn't place. But we know, uh, as time goes on, the likelihood of an implant showing up that you may not know what it is or how to restore it shows up at your doorstep and you're expected to, to handle that. So hopefully today, we take a, a very 10,000 foot view on uh, implant prosthetics and hopefully hit some highlights. Um, maybe not to drive granular points home, but just to bring attention to certain areas to identify some weaknesses in your prosthetic game. Um, we have lots of resources available to us. I'd be happy to help as the time goes on. So a few questions to percolate. So these are questions that if you're doing implant prosthetics, you should know the answers to these. What is a fixture level impression? What's a multi-unit abutment? Do I choose a locator or ball attachments for an overdenture? Should I use a custom or prefab abutment? What is a tie base? What's a UCLA abutment? What is the internal versus external hex? So the list goes on and on. Let's bring on Dr. Greenbaum. Engaging versus non-engaging components. So these are just a list of basic questions that I, I got stuck on early in my career and I have seen other uh, young clinicians get stuck on. So we're gonna, we're gonna co cover most of this and quite a bit more. The first thing I wanna talk about is, is implant uh, platform design. On the right side, we see the external hex, and on the left, we see the internal hex. These are terms we've probably heard before. The external hex was the primary platform developed by the early implants in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, at least the cylindrical implants. And there's variations to this, but that was the most popular implant right up until the internal hex came out. Internal hex has some advantages and is the, or was the leader of implant platform design before say 2005. And then we're gonna see what the more popular implant platform is. All right, so this is the side diagram of an internal versus an ex external hexagon. Um, it's not really important why they're all hexagons. The five sides tends to be the best um, ge geometrical shape when it comes to engaging implants, whether it's internal or external. Uh, there's a variation of that, and we're gonna talk about that in, in a second, but the hex seems to be the leader when it comes to the number of sides involved with the platform. So this is a pretty complicated slide, but it's important to know that when you have a hexagon, you'll often have a flat surface down at the bottom here. That flat surface, whether it's up high, up high at the implant interface or down low, uh, makes it difficult for the implant parts to fit perfectly. Whereas something like the Morse taper or the conical connection uh, has a very um, increased degree of flexibility. And we're gonna talk about that in a second. Here is a um, set of implants. This is the biohorizon line, the external hex, and the internal hex line. We use this implant line here. They come in different forms, but the prosthetic connections, as you, as you can see, are inside the implant and not above it. If we were to look at an implant and its abutment from the side, here is what we would see. Here's our external hexagon. And you can see that there's a large degree of horizontal components here. And what that means is that this abutment or this prosthetic component has to be very tightly connected here to not create what's called a micro gap where bacteria can, can, can get set up. But when you have this taper, whether it's a Morse taper or a conical connection, you have more wiggle room. This is a, a much tighter connection. And what you'll see shortly is that we're actually gonna use some of this in the newer age implants, this Morse taper or conical connection. Morse taper is uh, a more antiquated term. The conical connection is the more uh, updated term. The internal hexagon, as you can see, 
the abutment goes on the inside, which is a much more favorable biomechanical setup. And Dave, I can appreciate you have lots to say. Well, we're going to get to all of it. Uh, so the Morse taper, I believe Ankylos um, from Densefly was the first implant to utilize this, at least in America. It's also called a cold weld. Cold welding comes from uh, machining. And the cold weld connection is a mechanical connection where there's a very tight fit, almost to the point that bacteria can't live in between the two. Here's another diagrammatic example of an external hex where you have these horizontal platforms which are very hard to close when you take a screw and you try to screw down the abutment versus a tapered connection or conical connection where uh, there's a lot of room for um, continued tightening to close that micro gap. Here's an electron micrograph view of the Morse taper. This is very tight. For whatever reason, the ankylose implant didn't really take off. I don't even know if Densply still makes it, uh, but the Morse taper was their claim to fame, and I think the technology made its way into other implant companies, namely the conical connection you'll see in most major implant companies out there today, which is this. So when you, you'll often see when you're ordering implant parts conical. This term is going to come up a lot. What it's implying is there's a cylindrical, non-hexed portion of the internal part of the implant. Now, many implants will still have the hex interface so that the prosthetic can slide its way inside of that component. But as it's being tightened down, there's a uh, cylindrical or conical connection component to it, which has a much better micro gap component. David, you want to chime in here? When did you guys introduce the conical connection? So just to take a few steps back, um, the hexes that you were showing are showing a butt joint type of connection. So a flat, like you said, horizontal, horizontal. Uh, some other systems, including ours, still rely on a conical connection, just not as deep or intimate as like the one you're showing there. So internal hex implants, most of them rely on uh, a conical seal or a lead in bevel where you have that conical uh, fit, but it's just not as deep or, um, you know, pronounced as, you know, what they're showing on the pictures. But um, I would say, you know, the internal hex, um, when we launched it, um, you know, we, we made sure that it wasn't a butt joint type of connection. So we're talking 2005, 2006 range when we, when we launched our tapered, our tapered family. Yeah. So this is your line here. Yep, and you can see there the yellow and the green. You can see that lead-in bevel. Uh, that's that's what creates. It's not a true deep conical connection, but it's not a butt joint connection either. Sure. That's what creates the seal. Yep. Now, is the true conical connection still technically patented by Nobel? I know they bought the conical connection years ago, and they had a patent on at least their design, which was a deeper version of this. Yeah, there's been a, a huge shift in the industry to uh, a conical connection. Uh, we've even done so, um, you know, when we acquired another company. But I would say the conical connection is uh, very popular and a lot of companies offer it now. Um, so there's a lot of options for doctors to kind of look at yep. when it comes to conical. There's no, no one holds any specific, I mean, for their own uh, design, yes. Sure. But everyone, just about every company has their own type of conical connection and it varies whether it's the degree of conical connection, whether or not they have any type of vertical stop. Because with conical connections, one of the biggest issues is a vertical discrepancy in the restoration. And you know, as it keeps getting loaded and loaded, that restoration might sink deeper and deeper into the implant. And there's no stop, uh, no vertical stop to prevent that restoration from continuing to get yep. loaded. So that's, that's, you know, that's what we see. Right. Now, from my research in, in the pros literature for implants it's pretty clear that the conical connection has won the battle would you agree to that 100 percent. yeah and th that's not biohorizon conical connection that's conical connection um, worldwide so they've tested all the different implant uh, platforms the internal conical i don't know if the internal hex conical has necessarily been studied uh, but it's definitely conical connection is the current leader in 
um, implant prosthetics. So when you see that, just know that that's a that's a great platform to to use. Now, it's kind of up to the surgical dentist to place the implant that has that connection. So it's not a decision you're going to make as a prosthetic dentist unless you ask your implant dentist to place that kind of implant. So it's good to know these terms so that you can uh, guide your surgeon in the correct direction. At the end of the day, surgeons aren't necessarily looking at prosthetics. They're just hoping to place their implant um, and let it osteointegrate, and then it becomes your problem or our problem. So there's lots of different abutments, stock abutments, tissue level, straight, angled, all the way down. You know, this stuff gets confusing, and if you've ever opened up an implant manufacturer's prosthetic uh, catalog, it's mind-bending. Um, I probably text David <laughs> once a week on a question, hey, what's this, what's that? Uh, where should I be using this? And then they change them often. You know, they're changing them based upon the updates and the biomechanics that are being studied at the um, institutional level. When they change, there's new terms and you have to keep up with it. Um, implants aren't going away. Uh, they're becoming more and more popular. So I think as a general dentist, we need to know this stuff. So here's a pretty uh, simplified diagram or flow chart on the conversation versus standard abutment versus customized abutment. Standard abutments, also called prefab abutments, come in straight versions and angled, depending upon the clinical scenario that you're, you're presenting with. Uh, the customized abutments can come milled CAD, CAD cam, they can become cast and tie base. Tie base is a newer term. You definitely need to know tie base because it's becoming the primary uh, foundation for implant prosthetics because of its uh, clinical effectiveness, but most importantly, it's a lot cheaper than uh, milled or casted abutments. We'll go over that shortly. So I'm assuming we've all heard tie base. If you look at your lab's uh, prescriptions, odds are they've added tie base to their armamentarium of prosthetic interfaces over the past three to five years, I would say. Tie bases got a pretty bad name early on. And the reason for that was there were no metal primers that allowed it this allowed this zirconia crowns to bond to the metal. Fortunately, science got over that. They can they can now bond these really well to the point where you, you're not going to have delamination or separation of the crown to the tie base. But I have seen labs that have had a hard time with this. So make sure if you're using a lab, you might want to uh, have a conversation with them about their success when it comes to bonding to tie bases. Um, there's a lab in the Northeast here, they still don't know how to do it. They still won't even do it. They, they think that the technology is where it was 10 years ago. Now the reason why this is less expensive, you can see this is a titanium base. Uh, titanium obviously being less expensive than gold. Uh, which you'll find in a UCL, UCL, UCLA abutment. Uh, but it's stock, so it comes out of a box. And then the lab technician will take the crown and customize it, and they'll often put the screw channel in there, and they'll unite the two, making a screw retained crown with a tie base. You can ask for this separate. separate. You can ask for a zirconia substructure, depending on where in the mouth that you are. Um, you can also do what are called screw mentables, topic for another day. There's all kinds of different ways you can use tie bases, and because of their cost, they will become the most common uh, prosthetic platform out there. Has anybody used these and had success or not had success? We like, we like them real well. <clears throat> yeah, Jim. I mean, how long have you been using them? No, as soon as they came out, I don't know, 2005. Wow. And you, did you have did you have early issues with the with the tie base? No, no, uh, no I, we may have had one come off maybe from cementation. Sure, but that was before we were using uh, monobond or something like that on. <clears throat> yeah, well, if you we use, use it pretty them. routinely with um, like the Cerex system. So yeah. if we do an implant, I'll either. <clears throat> ideally make it a screw retained or B, mill off um, the abutment part and cement that to the tie base and then cement the final crown on top of there. And that's been pretty good. Mark, what are you using to bond? Uh, monobond, 
primer, well, air abrasion, you have to protect the bottom part of the tie base, air braid, the part that integrates with the crown, monobonds, and then I can't remember the name of the cement. There's one that's white opaque that's specific for it. Right. Um, but I've had one pop off that I got back from the lab where I didn't form the tissue on a premolar. And I asked him to push it out a little bit too much, and I was a little too aggressive in tightening it down. And all of a sudden, I torqued it, and then the crown pops off the tie base, and I go right. clean it out, re-cement it, and bring it back. Yeah, it's good. It's good to know what's happening with this stuff. So obviously, when you you had that clinical scenario happen with with that patient, um, my guess is you didn't send a lab slip off to the lab, screw retain crown, <laughs> and you just get back whatever yeah. the super version is. So understanding this stuff, if it fails, you know how to resurrect it if needed. And yeah, seven-minute fix and was able to do it. Great. Um, let's talk after. I'd love to hear more about that system that you're using. And it sounds very similar to what Jim's using. Um, yeah, I've, I'll take pictures tomorrow at the office. Great. Question. Uh, today we were looking at cements, and there's one that's, I can't remember what it was dense by. It's a big-name cement, but they said it's a zirconia cement. Has anybody heard, is there really a specialty zirconia cement as opposed to resin cement? Uh, I have not heard of that. Um, yeah, they advertise it as zirconia cement. You know, my guess is in the age of milled zirconia, the, the cement gap has different requirements than the older cast PFMs. So it's very possible that it has something to do with the cement gap itself rather than the material. Uh, zirconia with proper thicknesses is such a strong material, especially on an implant. Uh, you put that on a tie base, if the bond is good, I can't imagine the cement really matters, but definitely something for us to look into. So titanium cement, and you said mm -hmm. Dense Ply makes that? No, they, they call it zirconia cement. I, oh, no, sorry, I'm zirconia. not sure it was Dense Ply. It was a big name, though. <clears> that's the first time I saw it. It might be just a stretch in the marketing things going on. Yeah, yeah, that's something we talk about on this uh, sometimes, but I think you know, it's important for us to know that when new products come out, uh, be cautious. You know, I think, yeah. Jim, I think you could probably come up with 10 products that you use because it was the hottest new thing only to maybe swear <laughs> that you didn't try that. I, there's three products in my life that I've tried. You know, I tend to give stuff a little bit of time when they're really new, yeah. unless there's solid science behind it. But like you said, it's often a commercially driven thing. Uh, so this is a titanium base diagram here. There's two different ways to do this. You can have your screw channel come through the crown. This would be the case with a screw retained crown where the lab fabricates and actually glues the crown onto the titanium base. You can ask the lab to send these separately. You can order the titanium bases yourself and bond if that's something you want to do. Um, you can also create a, a, an abutment underneath and have the crown be cemented on. Uh, to be honest, unless there's an angulation problem, I'm not sure this is something you would necessarily do, but that option is available. Uh, we always want to try to minimize the interfaces we have. So an interface between a crown and an abutment, and then an abutment and a titanium base, and then titanium base to implant, these are all gaps. And we have to think of gaps as potential uh, reservoirs for bacteria. Granted, some of the cements that we use in here are so hydrophobic that's not going to happen but the small discrepancy from those junctions is, is a place where plaque can build up. And if we can avoid it, something we want to avoid. So talking about bacteria, the concert platform switching to some, is a term that I think we've all heard, uh, but understanding it conceptually might be uh, out of our reach. So I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about what platform switching is. Uh, but before we talk about platform switching, let's bring back that concept that we just talked about, the micro gap. So the micro gap is essentially a, an interface between two prosthetic components that have enough space that bacteria can, heart, can, can live there. That micro gap can be microns to nanometers, uh, but the point is that when you have a micro gap, you have potential bacteria accumulating. And the presence or the location of that micro gap in relation to biological surfaces is very important. Here's a few um, SEMs showing different micro, micro gaps, some better fitting than others. So what happens when we have micro gaps? So here's that but, buttress surface or um, Dave, what was the term that you used? Butt joint. Butt joint. So a butt joint 
you know, it's very difficult to, to get this prosthetic component to be super flush here when there are two horizontal components. You're going to have a larger micro gap with this external hex, which is why we don't use this uh, prosthetic platform as much as we used to. But this picture makes a very good point that there's bacteria here. This particular arrangement of abutment to implant, that was the conventional arrangement where the interface was uh, right about here. Now we know biologic width is a biological response to the presence of small amounts of bacteria. Our CEJ, that small little pitch change in our tooth is enough where there's a small amount of plaque that accumulates there. The body senses that and establishes the biologic width um, and the approximation of the bone a certain distance two to three millimeters away. Well, implants kind of do the same thing. So this bone right here is not gonna, it's not gonna stay there. The bone's gonna die back. We all heard in dental school, I believe it was a board question where um, there was an inquiry about how much bone, uh, bone loss vertically occurs around implants year after year. And I think the answer was 0.2 millimeters. I don't know where that came from, but that was once a question in a board exam. Well, that was the external hex. We expected bone loss around implants back then because the interface of uh, bacteria was so close to the bone. Now we have platform switching where we take the interface and we push it towards the center of the implant. As we can see here, this is a equigingival um, platform matching abutment. This is what we saw with the first generation of external hex implants. We'd get the bone loss around it. When you get bone loss, you get this cupping. We know that is a infrabony defect that harbors anaerobic bacteria and it tends to get worse and worse and worse until there's quite a bit of bone loss around the implant. Well, the platform switching concept really helped to move this in the better direction where the interface, the gap, the micro gap is actually located more towards the center of the implant. Now that happened to combine with the transition from the external hex to the internal hex where the components were more tightly fit. So there was less micro movement here. So the micro gap is the presence of bacteria, but when we chew, that abutment moves. Maybe the patient doesn't feel it, but there is a microscopic percolation of fluid here. The better the fit of the abutment to the implant, the less percolation there is. The platform switching component to the internal hex or internal conical connection drastically decreased the micro motion of the micro gap. So we have all of these, these concepts that have come out over the past 25 years, which have drastically improved the loss of bone around the implant. Then you add things like laser lock technology, and there's all kinds of things that we can do. We really don't see that anymore. So Dave, you want to talk any, any more about platform switching in its relation to successive implants? Uh, I would just say that for doctors that like to place subcrestal, um, having platform switched implants makes seeding prosthetics a lot easier. Um, you know, because of that connection moving away from the bone, you, you limit any type of interference you might have um, if you were placing the other type of design there where it's not platform switch. So, you know, most doctors want to place level with the crest, epicrestal, subcrestal, and, you know, because they're anticipating some of that bone loss, Hope you know, hopefully it doesn't happen, but um, just seeing the prosthetics is a lot easier when you have a, a platform switch design. Right. Or internal hex or conical. Great. This is another diagram just showing that there's a vertical discrepancy and a horizontal discrepancy between the two. So when you talk about platform switches, um, there's, there's two different components depending upon the implant company that you work with. Here's another example of platform switch. So you can see that the abutment is inset from the prosthetic component, uh, from the outer diameter of the implant. The other thing that's nice about this, uh, implants can be thicker when we platform switch. Is that a true statement, Dave? Yeah, coronally, the collar of the implant 
um, will be thicker on the platform switch implant. Absolutely. It holds true for our line as well, where you might see uh, a fracture um, posterior case where the wall is really thin on a non-platform switched implant. And that same diameter in a, in a different design, a platform switch design, uh, I've not seen any fractures. So yeah. the, the coronal wall, the collar is, is certainly thicker and stronger with that design, 100%. Yep. Now again, this that decision-making process is made by the surgeon because they're the ones placing the implant. But if you're a general dentist or a prosthodontist and you're working with a surgeon that has a wide variety of implants, you could say place a an implant with high, the highest degree of platform switching capacity. In BioHorizon's case, a 4.6 implant has a 3.5 millimeter platform. We can also do a 4.2 and a 4.5. So there's all kinds of, and I, I might be off a little bit, Dave, but the point is you have options with the same diameter of implant. So the diameter of the implant is defined by the outer diameter of the implant. The platform switch or the prosthetic components are defined by the inner diameter. The difference between the two is important because of what Dave said. The thinner it is, the more likely you're gonna get fractures. Now implants have gotten really good. That's not something you see too often. Uh, especially if you are using authentic components and you're torquing down to the manufacturer's instructions. But I like having a beefier platform of the implant because it gets that micro gap farther away from the biological surfaces, but it also increases the strength of the implant. This is actually a perfect example of that. So these are all, let's see, all 3.8 millimeter prosthetics, different sized implants. Equ equa, pl you know, equivalent platform, a very small platform switch, medium platform switch, and a very large platform switch. One can imagine that this implant is thicker and more resistant to fractures. If you haven't experienced an implant fracture, it'll happen. Uh, I haven't seen any with the modern implants, uh, but I tend to see them you know, the core vent implants that were popular during the, um, the early 2000s and in the 90s, I've seen several of those. Uh, the alloys are a lot better than they ever have been. With that said, if we have an option here to create a more biomechanically sound and biologically sound apparatus, why not do it? So any questions about platform switch? You younger docs that heard this in dental school, it was just a cool term you pass your exam and then you go out into the real world and somebody says it and you're like, oh shit. <laughs> what does that really mean? Uh, any questions about this? Or did everybody already know it? Perfect. Let's move on. Radiographic evaluation. This is a tough one. I have for many years thought I understood what it meant to be have prosthetic components seated when you take your radiograph to confirm uh, proper adaptation of the impression coping of the abutment so on and so forth all i'm going to say is whatever implant you're using make sure you have something like this from your manufacturer showing you exactly what a seated component looks like and what it doesn't look like um, david early on he had something he shared with me I now know when I'm looking at an x-ray of a biohorizon implant, exactly what to look for. Um, this looks like a Nobel line. Uh, the point is that you really have to know what you're looking for. You, you see all this space in here. Is that okay? This image is kind of hard to see. Let's see, I think I have another one. Yeah, this is a better image here. What you're looking for uh, in general is ceiling right here. So I used to see all of this here and I'd be like, oh my goodness, there's all this space here. I must not have seated the abutment far enough down. Um, none of this matters here. Did you seal this right here? If you have a conical connection, you have a high degree of seating it properly. That's the whole idea of the conical connection is it's almost, it's almost dummy proof. Um, the internal hex, very much the same. The internal hex with the conical connection, same thing. The external hex, much more different. You're likely to see a space somewhere around this area here. The point is, make sure you know what you're looking for when you take this image. Make sure that when the assistant takes the x-ray, 
that you're horizontally or sorry perpendicular to the long axis of the implant. How do you know that? The threads are sharp. So when you take an image of a, of, a, of a connection, you might get a false positive if you're not actually perpendicular to the implant. And the way to tell that is the sharpness of the threads on the implant. If you don't see sharpness here, you're coming at an angle and you might actually get a false sense of what's going on in this area. So David, I put Strom in here just to get your your, your water boiling. You want to share anything about uh, radio graduation. We could hire someone full time at BioHorizons because all the reps are always getting inquiries from doctors about seeding of prosthetics, and it's definitely an area where um, you know there's, there's always there's always questions about that. Sure. One of the things I remember asking you, Dave, was this down here. You know, I, I kind of felt like the the bottom of the prosthetic screw. So this is the screw that comes inside. Let me go back here. That comes in the screw channel. Uh, it's, this doesn't have to be all the way down here. As a matter of fact, they leave that space there on purpose. Uh, so seeing this space used to concern me. There were other implants I've used in the past where this was actually flush. Again, it really comes down to your particular implant manufacturer's um, specifications for radiographic evaluation to make sure things are seated. If they're not seated, your micro gap becomes what? A macro gap. Definitely not good. Your occlusion is going to be high. Uh, the screw is going to become loose because of uh, ill-fitting components. So super important. So this is a pretty, uh, pretty important picture. There's a lot going on here. Uh, I originally found this photo to have the discussion about hex versus, or sorry, index versus non-index components. Uh, but this picture has a lot more. When it comes to implant-supported bridges. There's a lot of decisions that have to be made. One is, are you going to do a screw retained bridge? Um, if you want to go mad, yes, go ahead and do that. Um, most doctors will these days will do two custom abutments and then a conventional bridge cemented on top of that. The reason for that is path of draw. If you do a screw retained bridge, where the entire unit is in de or it's mounted to the implant body directly with a screw, things have to be parallel. Lots of things have to be parallel. Not just the implants, but the screw channels inside, but also the guide planes or the proximal surfaces of the adjacent teeth. Jim, you've been doing this a little while. Have you ever tried doing screw retained implant bridges? And if so, do you still do them? I was still doing, but it's it was always the proximal contacts that really nailed us. Yeah. Yeah, well, wicked. When I think of proximal contacts, I like thinking of guide planes mm -hmm. for, for partials. So right. we often prepare teeth for partials. I will say preparing teeth proximal to any implant, whether it's a single unit crown or definitely a bridge, you want to make sure that you consider creating a flatter surface. And there's there's reasons for that hygienically, biomechanically, but it has to, a lot of it has to do with the path of draw. If the lab senses that the path of draw is past the point where um, you're likely to get a good seat, they often will call you and say, I don't think this is going to seat very well. Do you want to create a set of customized abutments and then a uh, conventional cemented bridge on top of that? Uh, but this is something to take into account path of draw when it comes to multi-unit abutment br implant supported bridges hey dr roy yes real quick um the seth yeah yep. so i know i know with conventional bridges when you're looking at the connectors you want a certain square millimeters 12 or 16 square millimeters does that change uh with implants or is that the same are you concerned with that what, when you're talking about the surface area, are you referring to the occlusal surface? No, you're the connector between your abutment and your pontic. I see. So like the um, the surface area, cross-sectional surface area of the of the connector. Yeah, because I know I know that changes depending on the materials you use for conventional bridges, but 
wasn't sure if it's something you think about with implant bridges as well. Yeah, we're, it's a good question. Um, the labs have gotten pretty good with that. that. That was definitely a consideration during the PFM days where the metal substructure had to be large enough, you know, like you said, for conventional bridges. Uh, now that things are mostly zirconia, it's typically a monoblock of zirconia, and the labs know what that minimal cross-sectional area is. Um, I haven't had an issue, but I will say that it is more important with implants because you don't have that give, you know, with natural teeth and the PDL. Uh, so I, I think my answer is I think labs have that figured out, but it's definitely a conversation you'd want to have with your lab. Do they know the minimum cross-sectional area for the, the connector? Uh, th that's definitely more important if you're using laminated materials. So a PFZ, yeah. PFM, but if it's a, um, you know, pure zirconia block, which often in these situations you want strength. And really, zirconia has gotten so good, even with the, you know, the 800 megapascal translucent zirconias, just they don't break, you know, awesome materials. So we've come a long way in the era of selected materials for situations like this. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Anybody else have any thoughts on this picture? So I threw that little comment there. Guide planes are not just for partial dentures. Why are guide planes important for, um, you know, aside from the path of draw issue? The flatter this surface, the better chance you have at a hygienic emergence profile. I didn't create a whole lot of slides on it, but let's just say for example that this tooth here had a large bulge in the distal direction. There would be a large undercut here. Well, implants lose a lot of their soft, soft, tic, soft tissue architecture from the perspective that we often lose bone. So a tooth comes out, we lose bone, we lose uh, interdental soft tissue. So we're already compromised here when it comes to soft tissue keeping out plaque and tartar. If you flatten the surface, then the prosthetic components can ride up closer to the adjacent tooth, thereby giving us a better chance to squeeze that papilla and maintain it for hygienic purposes. Any thoughts, questions? If, if there's anything you can take away understanding stuff like that, how to create implant prosthetics on any implant situation so that you maximize, or sorry, minimize plaque buildup is what really you know, sets us apart as clinicians that understand prosthetics of implants. Custom abutments uh, definitely help with that. So this is an example of um, an alternative. Now, we didn't really get into the conversation about cement versus implants. I think we all know that cement can cause cement sepsis. Um, there's all kinds of ways to avoid that. Um, I'm a huge fan of screw retained restorations, except for bridges because of the path of draw issues. Um, if you decide, this is a scenario that you can choose, which is let's use customized abutments and then take an impression of that. And then the lab will make a conventional bridge you seat it down, use some sort of cement that is easily cleanable, and you have no issues with cement gap sepsis. So here's another diagrammatic chart showing the different platforms. So let's just look down here. Actually, let's go to the upper one. So we have the mucosa. In this particular implant here, the implant platform is right here. So that's a soft tissue level implant where there's no flare to it. Here we have, the, this is the classic Strawman tissue level implant that was super common in the early 2000s all the way to maybe 2015. Um, that has given away for a variety of reasons, but you'll see this implant a lot, especially those placed by oral surgeons. And then we have the platform switched prosthetic platform. So a few soft tissue considerations. <clears throat> Let me start by saying doing this between two implants, extremely difficult. I, I almost don't even believe this happened for a variety of reasons, but there are ways to maximize the soft tissue between two implants. Going back to that previous conversation that we had, 
when we were talking about maintaining soft tissue between a natural tooth and an implant. That same holds true here. The only way we're going to do this is if we're doing something at the time of surgery that doesn't involve just a standard healing abutment. There's ways to do this, but the surgeon and the prosthetic dentist have to be on the same page or that person has to be the same person and they have to know how to handle that. What I'm going to say is try to maximize the amount of soft tissue that you maintain throughout this process for your patient. Nothing stinks more than having a patient spend five to $7,000 on an implant and all of the procedures with it, and then they say they pack food underneath it. I don't see your hands, but I can imagine if we asked how many people have experienced that, I'm sure we all have to some degree. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, these are things that can be avoided in many patients. Some of it's easy, some of it not so easy. But the point is, just referring your patient to the surgeon and then having the patient come back with that healing cap, you're just not going to get this, at least not to this degree. This here is actually a pretty good outcome. Number eight, nine implants is actually an unfavorable situation. Uh, lots of reasons for it, topics for another day. Uh, but when you have number eight, nine missing, I would say the, the more common scenario is actually to have one implant and have it cantilevered. Uh, it's very difficult to maintain this bone and soft tissue between two implants. Again, this is definitely a rabbit hole to go down. I just wanted to show this. This is a pretty good outcome. You actually have a little bit of a call here between number eight and nine. Not going to look natural, definitely going to look like square teeth. Um, but these are things that you want to think about when the patient still has teeth because there's ways to preserve that soft tissue. Um, I'd love to say that every surgeon has these considerations when they do surgery. I will say prosthodontists are more adept at this kind of thing than the average oral surgeon. Some oral surgeons are great. Um, but just referring and, and hoping is really what I'm, I'm trying to prevent us from making that mistake. Let's send the patients with very clear directions to the specialist saying, here's what we want done and here's why. If they can't do it, that's a different story. So another slide on soft tissue considerations. When an implant is placed, the size of the healing cap, the angle of the healing cap, this is your first opportunity to start creating an ideal emergence profile to maintain the soft tissue and the underlying bone. If you place a cylindrical healing abutment here, which was the, the most common uh, healing abutment for many years, they were just about the same size as the implant that you were um, placing the transmucosal healing cap on, we lost bone. If we create an emergence here, that tissue that's between the healing cap and the natural tooth has more reason to be there. If there's pressure here and some sort of stimulus, the bone underneath it's more likely to stay there. So then we go and we put our either zirconia abutment or titanium abutment, the tissue's already ideally um, contoured for us. So this is a very simple thing to do, choosing the right healing cap if you're the one placing the implant so that you don't end up with inadequate tissue between the implant and the tooth. For those of us that spend time on Facebook, dental Facebook groups, we've probably seen this. Uh, we've ordered it for our office. It's an absolute must have. Um, this is agnostic to any implant company. Um, you can use this for all major implant companies. It's a customized healing cap uh, fabrication tool. Uh, let's see if I can describe this. I, I highly recommend you guys, if you, if you haven't used this, go to this website, watch the videos on YouTube. It's rather ingenious. And this picture here shows the difference between a standard cylindrical healing cap or standard transmucosal healing cap. There's different names for this. This is what you get. Well, teeth don't look like that. They don't emerge from the tissue like that you're more likely to have prosthetic challenges with this versus this. Well, getting to this point requires a customization tool, and that's what this uh, dentist from, I believe, Italy came up with, a whole bunch of very neat and innovative tools. The first is this little guide pin here. This, this isn't very new, but when you place implants, you place different tools to make sure that you're centered so you get the implant starting in the perfect center. If you're not using a surgical guide, you could use something like this. 
Uh, but it's these images down here that get you to a point where you can create something like this. And then your final crown has this really nice natural emergence profile to it. The only way you're going to get to this without soft tissue training, which is an antiquated technique, is to have this at the time of surgery, whether it's a one-stage surgery or two-stage surgery. If you're not placing the implant, send one of these. You can fabricate these in your restorative practice and send it to the surgeon and say, please place this. If you get primary stability at implant placement, please use this as your healing abutment. And that's what it looks like when they place it in. So all it is is a space holder to create an ideal emergence of the future crown, whether it's screw retained, whether it's cement retained, custom abutment. It's definitely going to be a custom abutment because you want to obviously take advantage of this real estate. You don't want to do a stock abutment and then have all that space left over. Uh, but here you're creating an ideal contour for the future prosthetic solution. Now you can see how nice this is. Look at, look at all that tissue there. You know, this obviously was a very well done surgical procedure, but it was continued with very high end prosthetics. Has anybody Speaker, are, those, are those blue silicone rubber things? Yep. And is that company Canadian Implant Dentistry, the place that does it? No, them? this was a Instagram post. Um, huh. The name of the company that makes this is Cervico, C-E-R-V-I-C-O. And you can email hmm. me, I'll, I'll send you their stuff. Yeah, I've seen it around. It's it's really cool. It's a uh, it's a game changer. Uh, we've yeah we we haven't made it. It's not mainstay yet in our practice, but we've definitely several of us have used it, and we get outcomes that look just like this. You know, it it really does a good job. That silicone index. All of these are different diameters and shapes and sizes. Uh, the underside of this has a a spinning wheel where you can change the components that match up to your spark, your particular implant system. So you can really use any implant system with this. Uh, but this really takes you from the old style tissue level implant where you kind of hoped and prayed that this rim of the implant didn't have any exposure. That's why the tissue level implant is not something people use anymore to a high degree. Definitely not in the anterior. Here, that's a bone level implant with all of this real estate of soft tissue uh, that gives us the really nice emergence profile that one maximizes aesthetics, but more importantly, it maximizes this call of tissue right here to make sure that we minimize plaque entrapment between the implant and the adjacent structure. Dave, have you have, have you seen anybody use this in your journeys? I don't know if you've seen it. Oh yeah, office. absolutely. I've, so seen, I've seen it used in a few offices. I would note too that for doctors that don't want to make their own uh, custom healers for training tissue, there's a company called Anatotemp, and Anatotemp has the you know anatomically shaped healers uh, already fabricated, site specific that you can order for uh, any implant system. Um, you know when you factor in your time to make this versus just ordering, you know one of these uh, prefabbed anatomically shaped healers. It might make sense, but I will also say that Anatotemp's uh, healers are also scan bodies. So now you have an anatomically shaped healing abutment that's also a scan body. So it never needs to come out until the final uh, delivery of the restoration. It's pretty slick. Now, is that specific for BioHorizon? Nope. nope. They make them for every implant system. So what what's on the Anatotemp? That mm -hmm. registers the particular implant for the lab, for the yeah. There's um, there's, like there's dimples on it. Gotcha. There's there's like a it's not like a it's like a it's a coding system that they use. There's dimples on it depending on the implant system. Like I know BioHorizons, you know, I think it has like uh, three dimples which need to go to the buckle um, on the on you know when so when you're placing your implant, you have to make sure that it's oriented properly so that when you see this. You know, not a temp healer on it. It's the the dimples are to the buckle. Gotcha. So, yeah, they have different they have different coding systems for different implants. Yep. Now, w one might ask tissue training. What is tissue training? And I said that's an antiquated term. And I think this picture maybe articulates what that is. Tissue training is a process where uh, a cylindrical healing cap was used, and then you, the prosthetic dentist, does something 
to quote unquote train the tissue to form something like this. We now know, especially with implants and having aggressive thread designs, that we can get primary stability. We don't have to cover implants anymore, at least 90% of them. Most, most implants, when they're placed, have primary stability. If done well, um, you can put a temporary on that right away. If you don't want to put a temporary, you can definitely put something like this. Tissue training is a technique that prosthodontists used to do over several appointments. It's just a waste of time. You know, if you're going to charge your patient for that, you're, you're just missing the boat. Have a solution ready at the time of implant placement, way more efficient, better for the patient. Engaging versus non-engaging. We're running up on the time here. We only have seven minutes left. Um, engaging versus non-engaging. When you order prosthetic parts, whether it's an impression coping, a temporary abutment, what have you, you will often see engaging versus non-engaging. When we talked about the implant bridge, uh, we didn't necessarily focus on the prosthetic underside, but anytime you have a bridge, you probably want to have non-engaging abutments. Single units, you want to have engaging. Reason being, a single unit could spin. If you didn't have this hexagon shape on the inside of the implant, uh, you would have rotation around the axis of the implant. But when they're splinted to each other, you don't need the hex. As a matter of fact, it's unfavorable because of that path of draw issue that we talked about. So when you're ordering, make sure you know that if you're ordering for units more than a single crown, whether it's an all on four, a splinted bridge, you know, a roundhouse, whatever it is, multi-units, you're using non-engaging abutments. Any thoughts here, Dave? It's a pretty common question that comes up in the early journeys of implant prosthetics. Yeah, you're eliminating the anti-rotational feature in the prosthetics because you don't need it because there's multiple units. You hit it. I threw this in here. There's a lot of companies coming out with um, angled abutments for all kinds of different solutions. This is a I don't know, Blue Sky Bio angled tie base. You know, angled implants are often prosthetically challenging, and there's all kinds of different solutions with angled screw channels. Um, I'm just bringing attention to the fact that there's solutions out there that help us with these things but a lot of them are newer concepts and we tend to rely more on the custom abutment. Just gonna leave it here. UCLA abutments. Um, I don't see the purpose of UCLA abutments anymore. UCLA abutments, obviously designed by the dental school in California, was essentially a kind of like a plastic housing or a wax housing on a gold alloy substrate this plastic piece would be uh, waxed upon. So the lab technician would wax on here and they would do the burnout or the lost wax technique to create the PFM crown. So the metal part was already there. This sleeve, or in this case here, the yellow sleeve was essentially uh, a part that was burnt away during the processing. Um, the problem is these abutments have a high gold comp uh, component. And I don't know if anybody's looked at the price of gold in the past 10 years, it's very expensive. This is why the tie base has become more regular. But when you see UCLA, this is a common thing for PFM crowns or PFM appliances. Here we have a variety of different materials. Peak polyethyl ether ketone is a very periodontally compliant material that we use for all kinds of purposes. I love it for my temporary abutments. Um, there's all kinds of different purposes for this. But as you can see, there's all of these different choices when it comes to prosthetics. And of course, for each one of these, there's index versus non-index. There's different tapers, there's different soft tissue heights, so on and so forth. So understanding this stuff as we get more and more into the world of implant prosthetics is super important. I threw this in here. Uh, the goal of this was not to be about surgery. I just want everybody to know that tilted implants in dental school were scoffed at, but when you splint implants, you can splint them together. Are you, sorry, you can tilt them. Why are tilted implants so powerful? Well, it allows us to avoid anatomical deficiencies in certain areas. In this case here, this patient didn't have a whole lot of bone. These are zygomatic implants where the implants are actually screwed into the cheekbone. This is a, um, a nasal bone implant. This is a pterygo pterygoid implant, and then a substructure is connected. When we place single implants, we want them nice and straight. 
we want them perpendicular to the occlusal surface. So when you see angled implants from surgeons and a larger substructure is sitting on it, just know it's okay. And the reason I brought that up is the concept of multi-unit abutments. And I'm not gonna dive too much into this. Uh, this is in the world of full arch solutions. But when you see the term multi-unit abutment, just know that there's multiple units to help reangulate the angle towards the prosthesis. So you might have an implant that's off 17 degrees or off 30 degrees. Uh, you need to reangulate, reangulate it somehow so that the head of the abutment is perpendicular, or sorry, parallel to the occlusal surface, multi-unit abutments. We now have titanium and ceramic abutments. This here has a titanium interface uh, sorry, yeah, titanium. This is a zirconia interface. I'm actually doing my first ceramic implant on Thursday with all ceramic components. The patient wants a metal-free solution. I'll let you know how it goes. Lots of choices out there these days. This is a good diagram of the emergence profile of a custom abutment versus a tie base. Tie bases lock us into somewhat of an early emergence profile. I'll leave, leave that there. I think this has, you know, customized abutments have their place for better soft tissue contours. The problem is these are much more expensive. So when cost comes into it, it's always uh, a playing factor. So here we can see that there's a micro gap right here. Look, look how far underneath the soft tissue it, the micro gap is with a standard or a titanium abut or a tie base abutment. Customized abutment, we can stop the abutment interface wherever we want, normally about 0.5 millimeters sub G. We have a micro gap much farther away from the head of the implant and also not buried underneath the tissue. These are just important things as you make decisions. Um, soft tissue collar height of implant prosthetics is important. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. You know, you need to know if you're ordering locators. I think I had locators right here. You need to know what the cuff height is. So if you're doing a two implant overdenture, the company says the ideal height is the height at which this little gap right here is one millimeter above the soft tissue. If you place this guy in a one millimeter transmucosal dimension, you're gonna have biomechanical instability. So understanding this stuff, again, is important. Angled screw, cha screw channel solutions, these exist. Compression copings, closed versus open tray. In today's day and age, I think the consensus is it doesn't matter. I still do open tray. I just feel better about it. Uh, Dave, is there a predominance in your world on open versus closed tray prosthetic impressions? Well, I think most people are trying to do scanning now. But, uh, you know, I think... Stole my uh, thunder, man. <laughs> All right. I mean, that's a good point. You know, there, there's no error with scanning. Yeah. There you go. Well, before scanning, what was the predominant impression? Oh, definitely direct open tray. Um, you know, if you can get the best of both worlds, like a closed tray technique and a direct transfer, um, doctors will really like that. But uh, traditional direct transfers, um, you know, is an open tray technique. A uh, little trick here, when you splint implant together, you place the floss and then GCU pattern resin or triad gel to unite these together. Again, th these are full arch conversations we could have for an another day. That's it. So we just covered a ton. I mean, that, that could have been an eight, eight hour lecture where we spend a lot more time diving into it. Um, I apologize, it might've seemed a little rushed. I just got back from Livermore Falls, our practice up there and uh, the day went like many days go, especially Mondays, just went south. So we, we got back Mondays. later. Mondays, you know? Mondays, man, it's amazing. If we could put Mondays to Fridays, you know, it would be, be a whole lot better, but it's just not the way it works. All the tooth problems have been aggregated over the weekend onto one day. Mm -hmm. All right, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, again, this wasn't a, uh, a pitch for BioHorizon. Andrew Galvin was on here too. Uh, it was more just a discussion about implant prosthetics and how complex this can get, but more importantly, how relevant this stuff is to our everyday practice. Do not rely on your lab technicians to do this for you.
Many of them do not have 10% of what we talked about today. Uh, lean on your implant reps. Dave has been, he's, you know, probably number three on my list of most texts of <laughs> anybody. Uh, super, your reps are there for you, and they almost always can answer these questions. So on that note, good night, everybody. Stay dry, and we'll see you all next week. Thanks, Dr. Roy. You got it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. See you, guys. Bye. Bye.